In the recent debate between Graham Hancock and Flint Dibble on the Joe Rogan experience, Flint spends a lot of time discussing the domestication of plants and how we can tell if a plant's been domesticated or not. And this section is being touted as like one of the biggest wins for team archaeology in the entire debate. And indeed, it does seem like Flint very much knew a lot more about it than both Graham and Joe, and the uh, case that he made does seem pretty watertight. But is it watertight? Are all the claims that he made accurate? Is there any glaring errors that might undermine his position? Well, let's talk about that for a little bit. Hi, I'm Dan, and welcome to Dunking. As Flint makes his case for the record not showing the domestication of plants during the Ice Age, Joe asks him the following question. Um, but is it possible that this cycle of domesticating wheat and beans and all these different things has taken place many, many times? And that if you left them alone, they would go back to the wild form? How long would it take for them to revert back to their original thousands state? Thousands of years again. Thousands of yeah, years yeah, again. thousands of years. How many thousands be, of years, you think? Well, I don't know, because we, I mean, we've, I'd have to look that up. Well, I do know, or at least I have a pretty good idea, because about a year ago, I made a video on feralization, and it's one of my earlier videos, and uh, it's back in the days when I didn't script them, so it's kind of clunky, and by clunky, I mean the first half of it is me reiterating over and over again that I'm not a geneticist, so watch it at your own risk, but anyway... The point is, as soon as I heard Flint say that it took thousands of years, I, I knew immediately that that wasn't accurate. In the 2021 paper titled, When a Crop Grows Back to the Wild, Feralization, the abstract says, Feralization can be considered, under many aspects, the opposite of domestication. During crop and animal domestication, the wild forms gradually become adapted, under a regime of artificial selection, to a new environment where humans intervene to control their growth and reproduction, e.g. in the agroecosystem. During feralization, this process is reversed. Domesticated races escape human cultivation, return to a wild environment, or in any case, start to propagate and reproduce without human intervention, and revert to phenotypes more typical of the wild forms. For example, typical phenotypes of feral forms are the invasive habitus of some of the plants or aggressive behavior of the Australian dingoes. Thus, feral species escape from a regime of artificial selection and adapt to a new environment in the absence of any deliberate human input, reassuming some of the characteristics of their ancestral, truly wild progenitors. Assuming you watch the debate, you'll know that Flint pointed out a couple of markers to look for when you're looking for domestication of plants, and basically they all revolve around seed shattering, and what that is is the ability of a plant to like drop its seeds as soon as they ripen which is something that humans do not want on our plants. So it's something that has been presumed to have been bred out for a long time, although I have to say that Flint does say this in the debate. It's really cool because it's not human selection either. In fact, 40 years ago when we first started studying domestication, we thought that all this was due to conscious human selection. And now we know that it's actually the plant adapting to us and what we do. So it sounds like the consensus is now different. What's not different is the reality of a plant that drops its seeds as soon as they ripen makes for a suboptimal food source, especially in regards to grains. Grains are already small, and the early grains were even smaller, so picking them off of the plants would have been hard enough. Gathering them from the ground would be absolutely tedious. And that's why we thresh grain. We beat the plant until the seeds fall off of it. This requires a happy medium, though. If the seeds won't fall off when you thresh the plant, it's almost just as bad as picking the seeds out of the dirt. The seeds need to shatter from the plant under just the right amount of stress in order to be an ideal food source. Now, as Flint mentions in the debate, there are two genes that control this process in wheat, and both are fairly well understood. In rice, it's a bit more complicated, with three to five quantitative trait loci controlling seed shattering and multiple paths to shattering present in the genetic record. Now, let me repeat that. There are multiple paths to seed shattering present in the genetic record. Different parts of the plant can be utilized to encourage or discourage shattering, the abscission layer is a part that forms near the seed to hold it in place until it ripens. It can grow earlier or later, thicker or thinner. The grains themselves can break off in a few different ways, and this is all present in the record. As a matter of fact, the genetic record of rice does show a solid potential for it to have been domesticated and then feralized into domesticated again. I mean, the QTLs, the, the quantitative trait loci that, that dictate this in rice, they're, like, you know, they're numerous, and it's, it's a weedy mess, pun intended. But to give you an example of just how crazy this whole thing is, in the paper Asian wild rice is a hybrid swarm with extensive gene flow and feralization from domesticated rice, we read the following. The domestication of rice remains controversial with multiple studies reaching different conclusions regarding its origins. 
These studies have generally assumed that the populations of living wild rice, or Rufi Pogon, are descendants of the ancestral population that gave rice to domesticated rice, but relatively little attention has been paid to the origins and history of wild rice itself. Here we investigate the genetic ancestry of wild rice by analyzing a diverse panel of rice genomes consisting of 203 domesticated and 435 wild rice ascensions. We show that most modern wild rice is heavily admixed with domesticated rice through both pollen and seed-mediated gene flow. In fact, much presumed wild rice may simply represent different stages of feralized domesticated rice. In line with this hypothesis, many presumed wild rice varieties show remnants of the effects of selective sweeps in previously identified domestication genes, as well as evidence of recent selection and flowering genes possibly associated with the feralization process. And this is from recent times. I mean, this is, you know, just the last few thousand years. Try to suss what happened 15, 20,000 years ago, and it's going to be a whole lot harder to discern. Just, just listen to the titles to these two different papers. Molecular Evidence for a Single Evolutionary Origin of Domesticated Rice, or The Rice Paradox, Multiple Origins but Single Domestication in Asian Rice. Both of these papers can be found linked below, as can all the sources cited here, but the point is the waters are so unbelievably muddy, we cannot safely say rice was not domesticated during the Ice Age and feralized afterwards, only to be re-domesticated again. Matter of fact, that hypothesis would explain some of the anomalies we see in the genetic record. However, like most forms of digging into the deep past, unless they actually entertain the possibility of further back origins, the evidence could well be missed, even if it's sitting in a museum somewhere already. Now, some may be inclined to say that Flint was being dishonest when he said that about feralization, but there's a couple of reasons that I will say that's not the case. And, and the first one is that the feralization process completely does take a couple thousand years, they say. But the markers show up right away, like he was saying about domestication and stuff. And, and this is really, it's, it's all about the plants reacting quickly to the environment, like Flint says. Selectionary pressure. It's the pressure of humans now collecting it and then planting it. So as soon as there's one seed that's like that with that mutation, it slowly proliferates every single time humans replant it in a new field. So those are subtly different from each other. And the second reason that I would say that he's not lying about this is that he's not a geneticist and feralization is poorly understood even by geneticists. The thing is, is that, you know, like, like they talk about at the end of the debate, like scientists need research funding. And when you're looking into the, genetis, the genetics of plants, the money tends to come in farming and stuff like that. So feralization, is, it only shows up when it actually is like beneficial to farming or something like that. Not only, but quite commonly, that, that's where you're going to see it the most. For example, one of the papers I used in my research is titled Diverse Genetic Mechanisms Underlie Worldwide Convergent Rice Feralization. And it starts with the following statement. Worldwide feralization of crop species into agricultural weeds threatens global food security. Weedy rice is a feral form of rice that infests patties worldwide and aggressively outcompetes cultivated varieties. Despite increasing attention in recent years, a comprehensive understanding of the origins of weedy crop relatives and how a universal feralization process acts as the genomic and molecular level to allow the rapid adaptation to weediness are still yet to be explored. So the research has to have real world benefits in order to get that funding. So it's not surprising that Flint's not aware because he's not a geneticist and that's the, the study of feralization doesn't really come up so much in archaeology as it does in like farming and stuff. So I give him a pass on that one. I, I don't think it's being dishonest. But when it comes to feralization, in the paper I mentioned earlier, when a crop goes back to the wild, the authors say, although these recent studies of feralization in plants revealed several genomic regions differentiating feral from their progenitor domesticated forms, it is not yet clear and to what extent feralization involved additional direct or indirect changes affecting plant metabolism and its regulation. Uh, that's a lot of word salad there, but basically what that's saying is, is they're not really sure what happens when things get feralized, but they're starting to figure it out. And that paper isn't even four years old. So again, not surprising he doesn't understand this stuff very well. However, the way that he portrayed it was to shut down the uh, argument that Hancock was making. And in this case, you really can't do that. We don't know enough about rice in particular to say that it hasn't been domesticated and feralized and domesticated again. It quite possibly could have been. Then, you know, uh, for those of you who've watched some of my other videos, you know that my, my prime candidate for Atlantis or lost civilization or whatever is Polynesians or proto-Polynesians. So 
maybe they went to the sea when the ice age like went to hell and the younger Dryas and all of that and so they left their rice behind and it just went back to the wild it's speculation right but my point here is is that you can't close the door on that with the genetic record or with the with the microscopic record even because they don't know they flat out say they don't know. They can't even find out from a thousand years ago exactly which one of these has been feralized and which one's not. So when you look back 12, 20,000 years, no effing clue as we currently sit. Perhaps you don't believe me, but how about the Molecular Biology and Evolutionary Journal? The origin of domesticated Asian rice has been a contentious topic with conflicting evidence for either single or multiple domestication of this key crop species. Now, of course, it makes sense that the plants would revert to the most optimal way to survive. I mean, if you think about a plant that's not throwing off its seeds, it's not seed shattering, it, its seeds are just sitting there in the wild. So instead of sitting on the ground and growing into the next generation, it's just a snack waiting there for the next thing that comes by that eats those kinds of grains. So it's kind of critical that it throws those seeds as soon as possible. So the very first generation, the ones that really don't shatter very well, they all get eaten and the next generation shows that shattering coming right back. So it's just as fast as the domestication, it's the feralization starts right away. And um, I think that Graham and Flint both, if they thought about this for a few minutes, and, and Joe Rogan, all three of them, if they would have thought about this for a few minutes, I'm pretty sure that they would have come to the same conclusion. It's not that complicated of a concept, really, when you think about it. But, um, and, you know, it's in the heat of the debate. You get all emotional. Everybody knows how that goes. You get all angry and pissy and fight, 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 fight. And, well, we end up with, with what we got. Now, I'll be responding to the rest of this debate like I did this part, really, where in piecemeal, where it's like one point at a time, one point at a time. That way we can get into the details and it's not like some big all-encompassing thing. That's what the debate was for. I'm going to talk about the individual portions of the debate and we'll look into them and look behind the curtain, right? And for those of you who haven't watched me before, be well aware that I swing both ways and that I will criticize Hancock just as quickly as I criticize Dibble. So don't get all pissy with me when you show up in the next video and I say something you don't like because all my subscribers have seen me say something I don't like. So just, just roll with it, baby. Around here, I call them like I see them, teams be damned. And, and you know, I wanted to respond to this part first instead of doing it piecemeal across, just in, in order. And the reason was twofold. Number one, this is like one of the biggest points being bandied about right now is proof of this big win. And it's not quite the big win that they seem to think it is, in my opinion. It doesn't seem like it, that adds up quite at all. And uh, the second thing is, is it kind of proves that you need to look behind the curtain here. You need to actually check your sources, especially in this community. My God, you absolutely have to check everything that anybody says about anything, even me.